Greetings to those who watch below. It's Friday, which means it's time for another stop on our paranormal road trip, and this week we're heading to the home state of one of the masters of horror. That's right, we're heading to Maine. But before we start, I'd like to say thank you to those who dwell below. An exclusive channel membership you can check out using the link in the description box. So thank you to Steffi Ray, Wicked Witch, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B., Jess Black Curtain, Christina Groves, and Matthew Colgan. Also, please subscribe to the channel, making sure you hit that notification bell so you never miss any videos. Also, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram, where I post hints to what videos are coming next. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Witch's Cackle by Abby McGee 2019 Growing up in a small town with a haunted history, you are bound to hear a story or two. I have had many experiences with paranormal activity in my life, some pleasant and some not, but this story still sends chills up my spine every time I talk about it. I would like to start by saying that because of the fact that I did not own the house that this occurred in, I will not be including the exact address, however, I will include the street name in the town. In the spring and summer of 2019, my fiancé and I were renting a house on Nicholson Avenue in Booksport, Maine, right up the road from Jonathan Book's gravestone. For those of you that don't know, Booksport is very well known for its haunted history. So, as two young adults that were raised in this town, and are very connected to the paranormal, it wasn't unheard for us to experience paranormal activity in some form or another once in a while. At first, it started out very minor. Little noises, things moving by themselves, that sort of thing. One night, we even came downstairs from our bedroom to find three bowls perfectly lined up on our living room floor. Little things like that were nothing that my fiancé and I were not used to, so they didn't really bother us. But then came the night that changed the entire feel of the house. On this night, we had stayed up extremely late, I remember dozing off around 1am. I had this nightmare that we were sitting in bed and we heard this gut-wrenching woman's laugh. It sounded like a witch's cackle. In the dream, it was as though I was hovering above the bed watching the scene unfold. I could see us sitting up in bed and I could hear myself say, What's that? As my fiancé got out of the bed and exited the room to go check it out. And then the dream stopped. The next morning, I didn't say anything about the dream, because I've had many nightmares and night terrors over the years, so I didn't really think anything of it, until later that afternoon, when we had some friends over. We were all just hanging out and having a good time, when my fiancé started telling our friends the events of the night before. He started telling them about the witch's cackle. I instantly felt the colour leave my face. I felt cold. I slowly looked up at him. Wait a minute, that actually happened? I asked, feeling myself start to shake. What do you mean? Of course it did, he responded. I stared into space for what seemed like an eternity. I... I thought that I had dreamt it. I remember being asleep. I remember watching the whole thing happen like it was a movie. It was not a nightmare. It happened. He then proceeded to repeat everything that had happened, down to every detail. Us sitting in bed, us hearing the cackling, me telling him to go check it out. Everything. He told me that when he went to see where the laughing was coming from, he got out into the hallway where the lights were on, and that it sounded like it was right in front of him, almost in his face. He then followed it downstairs into the kitchen, and then it stopped. I felt the chills running up and down my back. After that, there was a constant feeling of dread in the house, it always felt like we were being watched, like we were strangers in our own home. It seemed like every time I had laid down to go to sleep at night, I could still hear that awful laughing, like I was being taunted by something that I could not see. We never found out what it was, but what I can tell you is, it was truly evil, and I don't believe that it wanted us or anyone else living in that house. Once that entity made itself known, you could truly feel the darkness of it, and there was no peace in that house for us after that. We moved out a short time later, and we have not been back. Yes, I have had many more paranormal experiences in my life, but this one was different. 
This was an evil that I had never experienced before. This was demonic. You could feel the evil like it was a sickness. I do not know who lives there now, but I hope for their sake they have better luck in that house than we did, because I have chills right now even telling you about it. And this day, every time I tell this story, I can still hear the witch's cackle. The Legend of Jonathan Book It used to be called Booksport Railroad Station. The quaint red building that now houses the Booksport Historical Society Museum hints of a time long gone. One of rail passenger service and a thriving young town filled with promise. It's a bright familiar reminder, sitting close to the cool October water. Ed Book pushes the old white door open, steps inside, then takes a long look around. Here it is he said, motioning to a small room packed tightly with glass cases and books filled with brittle, yellowing paper. The room is cold and dark. Book winds his way through the space, thumbing the knobs of dusty lights, leaving a trail of illumination as he goes. One display toward the back of the room holds items chronicling the life of Book's ancestor, Jonathan. He carefully picks up a piece of paper with spidery handwriting, a list that traces back to Ed Book's grandfather, though he's unsure how many greats should be attached. Ed Book has an easy smile and a good sense of humour. He has shown many people this space and entertained their questions. From individuals curious about the stories to television news stations, he's told the legend time and again with nothing more than a slight shrug of his shoulders, as if to say, I've done this before, what's one more time? The legend surrounding Jonathan Book is well known in town, it's an entertaining story. It goes like this. Jonathan Book, a founder of Booksport, called Bookstown during his lifetime, died on March 18th, 1795. In 1852, Book's grandchildren erected a monument near his gravesite, on which an image appeared. According to popular belief, the image depicts the form of a woman's leg and foot, but not just any woman. There are many incarnations of the story associated with this mark, but the general storyline of each has withstood the test of time. The most common one is that a woman was burned at the stake, and my ancestor, Colonel Jonathan Book, supposedly condemned her to death, Ed Book said. One of the first records of this story appeared in the New England magazine in 1902, and reads as follows. All was ready and the hangman about to perform his gruesome duty, when the woman turned to Colonel Book and raising one hand to heaven as if to direct her last words on earth, pronounced this astounding prophecy. Jonathan Book, listen to these words, the last my tongue shall utter. It is the spirit of the only true and living God which bids me to speak them to you. You will soon die. Over your grave they will erect a stone, that all may know where the bones of the mighty Jonathan Book are crumbling to dust. But listen, listen all ye people, tell it to your children and your children's children, upon that stone will appear the imprint of my foot, and for all time long, long after your accursed races perish from this earth, the people will come far and near, and the unborn generations will say, there lies the man who murdered a woman. Remember well, Jonathan Book, remember well. There are various incarnations of the story, and the words supposedly spoken by the witch vary on who you ask. Another version of the story that can be found on a plaque beside the monument says, As the sentence was being carried out, the woman curses the colonel, and concludes with, So long shall my curse be upon thee, and my sign upon the tombstone. As the flames consume her body, her leg falls away, and rolls out of the fire. Her deformed son, rejected by the community, grabs the leg, further insults the colonel, and flees into the wilderness. The supposed witch's leg has been attributed to a simple flaw in the granite, and yet people come into town and stop to examine the monument, which is the original that was placed in 1852, according to the plaque that informs visitors of the legend. The legend of Jonathan Book has prevailed, but people such as Ed Book are around to tell the legend and support the history of a town and a man attempting to keep both alive. As for Book's own view of the story, the incarnation as he understands it has the witch saying the following curse. 
The curse will affect all of your family and your descendants forever and ever. I guess I'm cursed, Buck said with a chuckle. I often tell people I've had a lot of bad things happen to me, but I blame it on my own mistakes and maybe some other people that interact with me. But I never blame it on the curse. I don't believe in curses. I believe in stupidity and maybe a little bad luck. My Main Experience by Pretty Little Psycho My parents bought a place in Penobscot County a few years ago. I lived in the Carlisle area and drove back and forth on my days off to help them move house. It was a two-hour drive. They had little help, a bunch of animals and 40 plus years worth of crap to move, so you get the picture. So to set the scene, the house they purchased sits quite a way back from the road I'm embarrassingly terrible with measurements, but there was roughly three quarters of a football field between the house and the road. Most of the lawn leading up to the house itself is pretty flat level lawn, forest on all sides except for out front. Now that you've got that rambling visual, I was down at their new place, helping them do their thing and was out on the front porch of the house. It was late afternoon, still pretty light out, but the sun was no longer directly overhead. I noticed something moving out the corner of my eye and looked up to see two fog-like figures jogging across the front area of the lawn. At first I dismissed it and looked away, only to realise what I'd noticed was pretty weird and I wasn't exactly sure what the hell it was. With the length from the side of the driveway they were on to the woods, it would take about 60 seconds for anyone to reach the other side, going at a regular jogging pace. They were just past the drive so I didn't see them for long, but long enough to register that I didn't know what the fuck it was. The easiest description is it looked like two tall figures that looked like fog going at a jogging pace across the front of the lawn, one a few feet behind the other. I described them or it as fog because they were vaguely see-through. In other words, I could see the road and whatnot through them. They moved across the lawn into the woods beside the house and they were gone. I've never seen that before and I haven't seen anything like it since. I still don't know what it was. I have three ideas what it could have been. Number one, fog. But I saw no build up of fog anywhere on the lawn or at the edge of the woods. It was a warm fall day, no crazy humidity, no rain. And I don't recall there being any breeze that could have pushed them along at the steady pace they were going. Two, they were just joggers wearing super grey outfits, jogging down the road. But I'm pretty convinced that wasn't the case. These figures looked pretty bland, no clothing or facial features, no pumping limbs such as arms or legs, and any pedestrian on the road would have been cut out of view sooner by the trees due to the angle I was watching them from. I watched them go across the lawn into the trees rather than disappearing down the road and being cut off because of the tree line. My third thought was wildlife. I've lived in Maine on and off all my life and there's wildlife everywhere. But these were figures again, a smoky whitish colour and were in a tall upright position. It wasn't dark enough for me to doubt myself enough to say, oh it was just some deer, you were just seeing them at a weird angle. I really don't know what it was. I'd like to think there's a natural explanation and probably there is, but I don't know what it would be. There used to be a farmhouse built on the land that burned. No deaths though. Before that, I really don't know the history. You can see evidence of families living here for probably a few generations. Out back in the forest, there's mounds of trash, old glass bottles, rusted cans, various household garbage that was piled into mounds and covered in rocks. Not to mention, at least two rusted truck bodies from the 30s or 40s that are also quite a ways in the woods out back and quite overgrown. But even with evidence of different generations living there, I don't see how that would trigger a paranormal event of figures running across the lawn. I never understood exactly what it was that I saw. It was just very weird and very spooky. Catherine even if there was no local folklore or instance of car crashes both major and minor, 
the winding stretch of Route 182 that bridges Hancock and Washington counties between Franklin and Cherryfield would be creepy. There's a reason they call it the Blackwoods Road. Even the name sounds haunted. It's especially spooky on a foggy night, when the trees seem to bend in and enclose the road and block out the moonlight, leaving nothing but darkness. Some nights locals say you might see a woman walking along the side of the road, near the still waters of Fox Pond. Her name is Catherine, as the legend goes, and her spirit hasn't known peace for decades. You can choose to stop and help her, or not, but as the legend goes, not stopping could spell out dire consequences, whether you lose control of your vehicle shortly thereafter, or suffer some unexplained malady or bad luck in the days or weeks after. Catherine, named for Catherine Mountain, the 1,000 foot hill the road crest shortly after Fox Pond, may have been a real person, though when exactly she was counted among the living is debatable. Some say she was an actual Cherryfield resident named Catherine Downing, who died in 1862, and whose name can be seen on a stone in a nearby graveyard, though there's no record of that Catherine dying in an accident. Regardless, she's one of many ghosts that supposedly haunt the different corners of Down East Maine. Marcus Labrizzi, a professor at the University of Maine at Machias and the author of Dark Woods Chill Waters, has researched ghost stories from all over the world, but finds the ones from Washington County to be particularly creepy. There's certainly a number of them, from the talkative ghost of Nellie Butler, a sea captain's wife who died around 1800 in Machias Port, to the mysterious footprints following two women walking on a deserted beach near Rock Bluffs. The ghost stories from Maine and from Washington County in particular really stand out to me because of just how many there are, Labrizzi says. What also sticks out about so many of the stories, and in particular the Catherine story, is that they defy the old logic that the dead can't hurt you, only the living can. Catherine does inflict harm. There are a few essential elements to the story. She's a young woman. She's in a vehicle with her boyfriend or fiancé on a dark, foggy night, riding down Route 182. She is wearing either a white or pale blue dress. They get into an accident near Fox Pond. Catherine is decapitated. The body's boyfriend is never found. Catherine's spirit is doomed to walk the road, looking for help, her lover and her head. If she's seen by a motorist on the road, she sometimes has her head, sometimes not. He or she must stop to help her, lest they risk her curse. One story has a motorist not stopping for the ghost, looking in his rearview mirror and seeing her headless body in the back seat and crashing. The rest of the details vary, depending on the teller of the tale. Sometimes the accident takes place in the 1970s, and Catherine and her boyfriend are on their way back from prom. Sometimes it's in the 20s or 30s. Another iteration comes from some time in the 1860s, and Catherine and her fiancé aren't in a car at all. They're in a carriage, and Route 182 is nothing more than a dirt road, built atop an even older Native American trail. While Labrizzi hasn't seen her ghost himself, he's heard and experienced the strange phenomena associated with Route 182. There are lots of electromagnetic anomalies documented. You'll be driving along and the car will completely stall out and everything shuts down. It's like you go through a force field. It happened to me. I had kids and animals in the car. Even just last year, there was a fatal accident on 182. There's a lot of bad things that have happened here. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, making sure you hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. Also, which state would you like us to visit next? Make sure to let me know in the comments section below, and I'll be sure to pick one for next week. So, until next time, sleep tight.